Do you have particular people that you look up to? In life, I'm sure we can all point to people who have influenced us and the way in which we conduct ourselves, whether it's the example they have set us in the way they deal with certain situations, or the coolness and the calm that they display in the face of difficulty, or the wisdom that they impart about what to do, or the example they set as parents or leaders of a group, or the way in which they conduct themselves in the workplace that make us want to respond to them by saying, we want to be just like them. This idea surrounds us in our lives as we grow up and how we relate to the world. The media goes to town with it in the way in which they present celebrities. We get to know the exact details of what a celebrity wears, eats for breakfast, thinks about in certain situations that they find themselves in, thinks about in terms of certain situations that are currently being played out in the world, who they are relating to at the current time, and the example that they are setting to others, because all of this matters as to whether or not we should look up to them or not. And the mood of society is positive or negative towards a particular celebrity depending on whether or not a journalist is taken with them or not. The other thing that we can do when it comes to looking up to certain people is to believe that they are almost superhuman, that they don't have the same pressures or issues or vulnerabilities or weaknesses that we have, because they always look cool and calm under pressure. And if they do then their superhuman strength and ability helps them to overcome that pressure, or so we think. I'll give you an example of what I mean. When I was growing up, I loved watching snooker on the television. I still do, in fact. But when I was a teenager, I watched snooker players because I wanted to be just like people like Steve Davis or Jimmy White. I wanted to have their ability as a snooker player, and I was mesmerised by their ability to the extent that when I tried to be like them and try to take on shots on my own snooker table, I believed that they must have superhuman powers because I could never do the same. I was so mesmerised by them that for my 18th birthday, I asked my parents if I could have tickets to go and see the World Snooker Championships. It was very exciting when I was given the opportunity to go with my dad. We went off, Julie, to Sheffield to watch a second round match. But I remember that I was, when I was there, I felt incredibly disappointed by what I saw. The snooker was the same. The ability of the players was the same. But it all just seemed so ordinary. It almost felt like watching two men playing snooker in a regular snooker club, apart from the cameras, of course. And I remember feeling how vulnerable those people must feel. And I remember feeling how vulnerable these people with perceived superhuman powers actually looked. Gone were the people that I looked up to. I have since realised that there is a big difference between watching sport on the television and watching it live. Because although something live means that you can claim that you were there when so-and-so won, you don't get the hype and the excitement that is created by the sports commentators. Well, what has all this got to do with our readings this morning? Well, for a start, when we look up to someone, we have a danger of putting them onto a pedestal and viewing them in a light that is potentially dangerous to the relationship that we have with them. We have a particular view of them that sets them apart and higher than us. And then when we see them as they really are, as vulnerable and as weak as we are, the hopes that we have placed in them are dashed. What we are really doing is holding them with a sense of awe and wonder. And this is what the disciples were doing with Jesus. Just imagine, if you can, the scene as Jesus and his disciples pass through the village of Caesarea Philippi. The disciples have been with Jesus up until this point for about 
two and a half years. They've shared everything together. They've eaten together. They've slept in each other's company. They've travelled around together. They've hung on every word that Jesus has uttered. And they've witnessed some pretty amazing things, including healings, miraculous feedings, and control over nature. The disciples sense Jesus' otherness, and they are filled with a sense of awe and wonder. There is something special about Jesus. And now he asks them who they and the crowds who have been following him think who he is. This is their big moment, their opportunity to prove their faithfulness and their trust. And so they declare what they know. Some say you're Elijah. Others say you're one of the prophets. Others say you're John the Baptist. But we know that's not true. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah, the expected one from God, who's going to turn the world upside down, bring freedom to the people of Israel, prove that we've been right all along, that God hasn't abandoned his people. And what does Jesus do? Initially, it appears he does nothing to dispel the excitement and the expectation. According to Mark, he quietly affirms what the disciples have said, just warning them not to tell anyone. And then, quite abruptly and also shockingly, he takes the rug from under their feet, saying, you know this Messiah that you think I am? Well, that's not my mission at all. I'm not here to lead you to freedom from earthly forces. My mission is to lead you to freedom from your sin. The barrier that's stopping you from being in the right relationship with God. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and the Jewish council, and I'm going to suffer and die on a cross in order to be the perfect sacrifice for God. You can just imagine the pain and the shock that crosses the disciples' hearts and minds. Hey, hold on a minute, they say to themselves. How can you say these things about suffering and dying when what we've seen so far is an ability that no one else has? And how can the kingdom of God come if you're not there to lead us? The thought that the Messiah would have to suffer and die was not something that any of them had contemplated. And so the disciples elect a spokesman, a spokesman to deal with with the problem, with the issue as they see it. They send Peter to have a quiet word with Jesus, to tell him that they don't agree and that this will never happen. And Jesus treats Peter in a way that no one expects. Jesus turns to Peter and says, he's a stumbling block. And he compares him even to Satan and he republicly rebukes what Peter says. For Jesus is saying that salvation can only come with suffering and death. Hope and life can only come with the cross. It's no good just being mesmerised by the power and the authority of God because there's got to be a heart change as well. Up until this point, the disciples have been dependent on Jesus' power and authority. They recognise his otherness and they are quietly confident with this that they can stand up to anything. But now Jesus is saying this isn't enough. Humility and service are as vital. And those who want to be great must become like a servant to everyone else even to the point of suffering and death. This is what is so vital about the last part of the reading. True disciples do rely on the power, authority and majesty of God, but they do so through the way of the cross. Discipleship isn't easy. It's demanding. And like Jesus, may take you to the foot of the cross and even beyond. But in so doing, 
It turns the expectations and belief of this world on its head and transforms it beyond recognition. And this is what is so vital for us to understand as people who want to follow in the footsteps of our Lord. Yes, we do need to have awe and wonder at the authority and the power of God. But without the message of the way of the cross, the gospel message fails and falls on deaf ears and hearts. A suffering Messiah is hard to understand, but it takes us to the heart of the issue of God's relationship with his people. It addresses the very needs of people who need freedom from sin and from all the barriers that get in the way of shaping the world to the desire and design of God's heart. And if we want to be a part of God's kingdom, we need to recognise our need for the cross as much as for the life, teaching and ministry of Jesus. The two complement each other and through them we see the world as God sees it. Suffering and death bring life in all its fullness and lead us back into the presence of God who is rightly given our reverence, praise and worship. Amen.